is Drive Facta Sports Talk with Tanner Rabello, where we talk about the latest in Boston sports. Welcome to Drive Facta Sports Talk. I'm your host, Tanner Rabello. This is presented by Drive Network Sports. That is Drive Network Sports.com. Gonna kick it off here. It is um, filming this on a Tuesday. I'm gonna release it on a Wednesday. It'll be Wednesday, July 26th. So some of these takes might become old or whatever happens over the next 24 hours or so. Uh, but I'm going to kick things off talking about Kyrie Irving, the Cleveland Cavaliers, and how it affects the Boston Celtics. So the Cleveland Cavaliers are team number one in the Eastern Conference. They have t- players like LeBron James, Kevin Love, Kyrie Irving. They just signed Derrick Rose. They have Tristan Thompson. Uh, they have a bunch of good role players like Richard Jefferson. And if you look at that Cleveland Cavalier team, they are a good team. You know, they made it to the finals the last three years. They've won one of those. And now you have Kyrie Irving reportedly came out last week. David Aldridge reported that Kyrie wants out. He requested a trade, and he wants Cleveland to trade him. Yeah, listed a couple teams. Teams like the Minnesota Timberwolves were on his list. The San Antonio Spurs were on the list. The New York Knicks and the Miami Heat. So you have a couple prime destinations for Kyrie, including some out of the Eastern Conference would which even benefit the Boston Celtics more. But what I think is important that the Cleveland Cavaliers don't have to trade him. You know, this is a trade request. Of course, he can make it very difficult for them in terms of a PR perspective. But they don't have to trade Kyrie Irving. So this is where Cleveland's in an interesting situation. They fired David Griffin, essentially, their GM. And the last couple years, they moved on from a lot of GMs, a lot of different coaches. You know, LeBron came back, made that franchise relevant again. So you have a lot of different things going on with this team and with Kyrie Irving. You know, this is a star player. He's a very good point guard. And the fact is, he's always been kind of in LeBron's shadow the last couple seasons. You know, there's the importance of winning and then there's the be the guy who everyone counts on to win. When you talk about the Cleveland Cavaliers from two years ago, even Kyrie Irving hit the shot. But always, oh, look at that LeBron. Look at that block he made. It's always about LeBron. And I, I think with a guy like Kyrie, he wants to win, but he wants to win on his terms. He wants to win with him being the guy. When people talk about that championship, he wants to be in the center of it. When you're a player of his caliber, and you see the uncertainty that is the Cleveland Cavaliers, if you're Kyrie and you're thinking, oh, LeBron's just going to leave me next year? He's going to leave Cleveland again? Why would you want to sit around there? And if you're Kevin Love too, if you're Kevin Love, you're sitting there like, why am I here? Last three seasons, Kevin Love's been sitting there and has had these trade rumors floating around. And at this point, he sees Kyrie wants to jump ship. LeBron's probably going to jump ship to go out west. And Kevin Love might be sitting there holding the stick there. And um, we'll see what happens with that. But with Kyrie Irving, it's interesting. It really is. You know, he had the Stephen A. report, Stephen A. Smith report, where he said uh, that LeBron reportedly, if he was in the same room as Kyrie, he'd want to punch him or fight him or something like that. So it's really an interesting situation because a couple months ago, You had Kyrie Irving saying LeBron was like a big brother to him. So with Kyrie Irving, you know, he's a very good point guard. I saw some rumors about the Boston Celtics. It's not going to happen. Yes, the Celtics, they kick the tires on it, but the Boston Celtics are just doing their job. Whenever a star player becomes available via trade, of course you offer something. Of course you kind of look at it and say, what would you want? You know, what's the potential? What, What is the interest here to make a deal? So if you're the Boston Celtics... You just did your job. But I think what's going to happen here eventually is, is that Kyrie might not be traded <laughs> like right now. You know, they, they did sign uh, Derrick Rose. So that's an interesting development there. They signed a point guard. Derrick Rose can still get in the paint. He's a very effective paint scorer. Um, one year, two million and change deal. That's a great deal for the Cleveland Cavaliers. It's a proven deal for Derrick Rose. You don't really know what you're going to get out of him. But last year, I believe he played 64 games for the New York Knicks, and he showed he can be effective when he's on the court. So it, you know, you got Derrick Rose out there, and he might play a very big part of that team. They don't have to trade Kyrie Irving, but it, if there's something there, they might. The Phoenix Suns offered, I think, Eric Bledsoe, and they have a puck. A couple other draft picks could potentially offer. I think right now Josh Jackson's the holdup down there. The guy they just drafted, uh, top four, I think, uh, Josh Jackson. So it'll be interesting to see. I don't think Phoenix is going to want to move on from Josh Jackson, but if an Eric Bledsoe and a draft pick potentially gets that done for Kyrie Irving, I think why not, especially if you're Phoenix. And if you're the Boston Celtics, that's great. Kyrie goes out west. Um, But ultimately, he doesn't have a no-trade clause because they could trade him anywhere they want. 
in reality. He can push for a certain place, but when it comes down to it, the Cleveland Cavaliers can trade Kyrie wherever the hell they want. And the fact is, I think he wants out. You know, I think that's what happened. He's, he's at the point where he knows LeBron's probably going to leave. You know, he had the rumors LeBron could go to the Los Angeles Lakers next year or just somewhere out west. <laughs> it, it's just a crazy situation going on in the NBA. You know, you knew the Cleveland Cavaliers were going to fall apart eventually. You know, that super team's going to be broken up. That's what happens with teams like this. We saw it in Boston. You saw Ray Allen leave, and then they traded away Paul Pierce and Kevin Garnett. You saw it in Miami. You saw the exodus. LeBron went back to uh, LeBron went back to Cleveland, and then you ended up having Dwayne Wade last offseason to go to Chicago. So this stuff happens in the NBA. Players retire. Stuff happens. But people move on. And three final appearances for the Cleveland Cavaliers. That looks like that might be it. They're still going to be a good team. Don't get me wrong. I, I you think even without Kyrie Irving, you have a team with Kevin Love, LeBron James, Derrick Rose is some kind of player. Uh, Tristan Thompson, J.R. Smith. So if you have these guys together, I still think you're probably the number one seed, even without Kyrie Irving. But I think the Celtics are right there, and they have the potential to be that. And when I say number one seed, I don't really mean playoff seat position or a pole position or whatever, because the Celtics were technically the number one seed this past year. But no one's going to say that the Boston Celtics were better than the Cleveland Cavaliers. That's not how it works. I'm talking about talent-wise and head-on-head -head matchup, who's the best team. And, and I still think it's close even without Kyrie. Um, but if you look at the Boston Celtics, they got better. You know, they brought in Gordon Hayward. They don't have Avery Bradley anymore, so that's something of a loss right there. You know, we still got uh, Isaiah Thomas, Al Horford, who in theory should be able to get better. He brought in Jason Tatum. Jalen Brown should be better as well. You still have Jay Crowder. Uh, you still got Marcus Smart, who's still young and shooting a lot of balls this offseason, so maybe something will go on. You got brought in Marcus Morris, Aaron Baines you brought in. So you have some talent here if you're the Boston Celtics. And the Cleveland Cavaliers haven't really done much. You know, getting Derrick Rose in is a nice piece. He's a former MVP. There might be something still left in the tank. He's only 28 years old still, so there's still something there. And he's playing for a big contract. You know, he's playing to get that next big contract next year, which he didn't get this offseason. There wasn't a lot of interest in him. So if you really look at the situation here, it's unfolding. If you're the Boston Celtics, you missed out on Paul George. You missed out on Jimmy Butler. You know, you didn't go out and get these players. You didn't pay that high price. And now you're sitting here, if you're Danny Ainge, you're still in a great position. But you're wondering, maybe I should have went for it all now. Maybe I should have started my championship run now because you look at the Cleveland Cavaliers and what's happening there. And you understand there's an opening. There's a position now. There is room for you to win the Eastern Conference next year. If they trade Kyrie Irving. Granted, if you bring in an Eric Bledsoe, and you brought in a Derrick Rose, you're still going to be a very good team in Cleveland. LeBron's still the best player in the league. He's the best player in the Eastern Conference for sure. And that'll still probably be the best team. But you're there. You're closer if you're Boston. I think the issue with the Boston Celtics is you still look to the Golden State Warriors and you say, we're not in the same league as this team. No one is. No one is in the same team as Golden State. But you have an opportunity because the thing is, even if you're not in the same league, if you can get to the NBA Finals, anything can happen in a series. Anything can happen. Especially, you know, on your home court. You know, you have a guy like Isaiah who can go off. You know, you don't really know. Uh, but for the people who are saying that you would trade Isaiah Thomas, who is the number five MVP runner-up this past season for Kyrie Irving, that's ridiculous. That is foolish. Isaiah Thomas, offensively, is a purer scorer than Kyrie He's a more efficient scorer than Kyrie Irving. Kyrie Irving actually was the leading shot attempt player on the Cleveland Cavaliers over LeBron James. I, I would not give up Isaiah Thomas for Kyrie Irving. I think Isaiah is worth more than that. Um, and I think this is his team. I think that's where they're building it. They didn't draft Markel Fultz. They went with Jason Tatum because they believe Isaiah Thomas is their point guard. It's simple as that. You know, might prove me wrong with the 18 Brooklyn pick. They might go get a guard. But at the moment, it's Isaiah's team. And Kyrie Irving is not any better defensively than Isaiah Thomas. You know, Kyrie Irving is a great player. He can make clutch shots, but so can Isaiah Thomas. He led the NBA in fourth, point, fourth quarter scoring this past year. But if you're the Boston Celtics, this Kyrie Irving news is great news. It really is. And you have to wonder if Danny Ainge is sitting there right now with the guard and thinking... Maybe it's time to load up. Maybe it's time right now to go and inquire about a move. I think it's a little premature for that, to be honest with you. Um, 
know, if I'm Danny Ainge, I kind of monitor the situation. They trade Kyrie Irving. Let's see where that Cleveland team is, what they get in return. If it's Eric Bledsoe, okay, they still got worse, but they're still a really good team. So if you're Boston, you're just looking at the situation saying, how close am I to Cleveland now after this move? And if I go and trade for an Anthony Davis, if I give up my 18 pick, if I give up a bunch of stuff for an asset like that, am I better than Cleveland? You know, that's what you still have to ask yourself. So that's why it's kind of tricky if you're Danny Ainge. You know, if you end up seeing that the Pelicans drop off this year and they don't have a lot of success with the Marcus Cousins, Rajon Rondo, Drew Holiday, and Anthony Davis, if that core doesn't work for that team and Anthony Davis is getting shopped around potentially, maybe you inquire about that because you have multiple years remaining on that contract if you traded for Anthony Davis. But ultimately, you're going to have to see what it is. You don't really know. Um, because if LeBron indeed leaves Cleveland next year, the Eastern Conference is Boston's. You know, there's other teams, these up-and-coming teams, teams like Milwaukee, who we don't really know what they're going to be, but they're there. Teams like the Philadelphia 76ers have a ton of young talent. We don't really know what that team's going to be as well. So there's a lot of questions in the Eastern Conference. Not a lot of great teams, but there's teams who are elevating, teams who have the potential to elevate. So if you look at the Boston Celtics, they're probably one of the the top two teams in the league, in the Eastern Conference right now. But you don't really know what you get in Milwaukee. That team could be a really good basketball team. And, you know, who really knows? If you look at the Washington Wizards, I think you're, you're better than that team. I thought you were better than that team this past year without Gordon Hayward. Uh, so it's very interesting. You know, it, it, there's really no right or wrong answer if you're Danny Ainge right now. Because you really don't know what to do if you're sitting there in that office. Because you don't know what Cleveland's going to do. Because ultimately, you know, LeBron James and Kyrie Irving could work out whatever differences they have. And Kyrie could remain on that team all year. But if they, if the Cleveland Cavaliers have looked at the returns that teams like the Indiana Pacers and Chicago Bulls got for those star players, players like Paul George and Jimmy Butler, the return wasn't great on those trades. And if you're sitting there and you're Cleveland and you're, you're going to trade this guy, you got to trade him now. And I think that was part of the move of getting... Derek Rose and why LeBron was pushing for Derek Rose so hard was because he was looking at the situation with Kyrie Irving and was saying, well, we got to trade him now because there's no better time. His, his, his trade value is on an all-time high. Yeah, he's requesting the trade, so that might may put them in a disposition, but the best time to trade Kyrie Irving in terms of trade value is right now for the Cleveland Cavaliers because he's worth more. That's as simple. He's just worth more right now. And the diminishing returns on guys like George and Butler should be enough to move him for Cleveland. But I'm not ruling it out. I'm not ruling that LeBron James and Kyrie Irving can get on the same page and win championships together. It's just, you know, I I think things could change pretty quickly. And the fact that they were really good friends before, there's a possibility it happens. But the thing is, all signs point to LeBron leaving Cleveland. So I don't blame anybody for wanting to leave that team and jump ship now. Moving on, more of a Boston topic. I know Cleveland Cavaliers and the relation to the Celtics is a loose Boston topic, but I'm going to talk about the Boston Bruins, David Pasternak and Ryan Spooner. So this is coming out on a Wednesday, and that also happens to be the date of Ryan Spooner's arbitration. So this could be old news. So if, it, if the arbitration news comes out, if the Bruins have already come to an agreement with him, disregard this. But Ryan, the rumor is as of right now, that Ryan Spooner wanted two million. He wanted three point eight five million dollars for the Boston Bruins for one year. Boston Bruins offered two million. So essentially, the Boston Bruins can walk away from an agreement with him if the arbitrator comes back on the. He has until Friday the arbitrator, but they meet on the twenty sixth with the arbitrator. So if he comes back and he says, "Well, you got to pay him four million or more," the Bruins can walk away from that deal. But generally, what happens? So. It, Spooner's asking 3.85. Bruins are asking 2 million. Usually what an arbitrator does in the NHL is they'll pick some a number in between those two. So it's not going to be 2. It's not going to be 3.85. Is it 2.5? Two, 2.75? Is it 3 million? I, I think it's going to be probably an average of $3 million. You know, if you want to think about it, say Spooner was at 4, 2, it, the average would be 3, right? So I think it's be around 3 million, give or take 100,000 this way, 100,000 that way. Um... No, we'll see what happens with it. It's a very fluid situation right now. You know, one of the rumors is that 
Ryan Spooner and David Pasternak are, you know, they're they're good friends. We all know that. These guys talk a lot. And the rumor is that Pasternak's also kind of holding out his leverage against the Bruins in order to raise the value of Ryan Spooner in an attempt to, to make them work better, to get something done. And, of course, they can come to a different extension before the, 26, the, the Friday deadline. So you have this deadline on Friday. They meet with the 26th. After the 26th, they have until Friday. So they have two days, essentially, to come to some kind of an agreement. But, of course, the arbitrator can come out on Thursday and say, this is it. So he, they have until Friday, but in reality, they could drop it whenever after the 26th. So it could be the 27th on the Thursday. But the Bruins can still come to an agreement here with Ryan Spooner without an arbitrator. That would be the smart thing to do. The Bruins can determine the length. That's their right. Um, Bruins wanted one year, two million, though. So they want a one million dollar, a one year deal for whatever the price is. Because um, they don't want to c- commit to a, a third line center to that much money. And personally, if I look at this Bruins team, I'm more confident if you have Patrice Bergeron, David Krejci, and David Backus as one, two, three. That's your three centers right there. And you're rolling three solid lines at that point. And when it's a must win, must score a game, you bring Backus up. And you run two lines and you run a super line with Backus and Bergeron. That's what they did last year and was very effective and helped them make the playoffs. We'll see what happens with this team. You know, it's an interesting Boston Bruins team going through here. A lot of young players, guys like Charlie McAvoy, Brandon Carlo. Uh, Jacob Forsbecka Carlson. You have other players like Danton Heinen uh, who could come up as well. Uh, Frank Vitrano is still a really young player. David Pasternak when they re-sign him. The sky's the limit with this Boston Bruins team. It really is. This is a team that made the playoffs last year and in theory should be better than they were last year. Their young players are getting be- you know, more veteran experience here. Guys like Carlo and Pasternak continue to get more experience. You saw a little bit of McAvoy. A little bit of force Becca Carlson. You you really can explode here if you're the Boston Bruins. But the fact is you got to re-sign David Pasternak. Ryan Spooner, you have to bring him back ultimately. Um, he's a third-line center for you. I want David Backus to be that, but I don't think it's going to happen. I actually think Backus should be your second-line center because I think Krejci just hasn't been effective for you the last couple seasons. I've uh, been kind of in the fan not the, uh, a fan of potentially bringing in like a power forward kind of thing, like a Milan Lucic kind of player. Obviously not Lucic. Lucic is under contract with another team at the moment. But maybe like a Thomas Vanek kind of player, a uh, guy who's going to come in on the cheap side and can kind of slow down the game a little bit. Because with David Krejci, he's not a slow player, but uh, he's a player that definitely plays on a slower pace. And I think he could benefit from power forward. His most effective years in terms of success came with a guy like Lucic who is a power forward. So I think that could def- definitely benefit him because if he has a guy like you saw him with Pasternak, he, he can skate fast, but he needs a guy to slow it down a little bit, play his game more. And I think that's more important to the Bruins. Is when David Krejci is playing very effective, you know, you're going to have a very good hockey team. Because you know that first line with Marchand, with Bergeron, is going to be very successful for you. You know that line's going to be legit. The question is, what can you do with Krejci? You know, what's that second line going to look like? Who's going to center it? It's going to be Krejci, but... You have Bacchus, and Bacchus is he's a natural centerman. We saw it last year. Didn't work that well out in the wing. He worked fine, but his best position is going to be at center, and that's what they should use him as. I know David Bacchus has your third-line center at that price point in terms of his salary is a lot, but ultimately when you're on the power play, PK, stuff like that, you're going to move him around anyway. And When it's a must-win, must-score game, you're going to move him up anyway, so it really doesn't matter to me. I, I think he could be your third-line center. And you'd be very effective and very good at that. Uh, the question will be who's going to be on the wings. You know, you got a lot of forwards here. Don't really know where they're going to match up. Guys like Riley Nash and uh, Frank Vitrano. Is Vitrano going to play on your second line? I don't really think it's a good fit, especially with Krejci. I, I really think you need a power forward for Krejci. You know, the more and more I talk about it. Uh, we'll see what happens. You know, Bruce Cassidy has a tough job ahead of him here because there's a lot of young players to mix in in this organization. A lot of good building by Don Sweeney. And now it's time for Bruce Cassidy to act and figure out what these players can actually do at the NHL level. And uh, can we see some development and growth? Because I think in the Claude years, we saw a very small growth from players or back growth from players. Guys like Ryan Spooner took steps back. Um, Some players had great growth. Guys like Brad Marchand developed underneath Claude Julien. So it's tough to say, but I think Cassidy's just better at developing players because he has more experience doing that at the NHL level. So hopefully we see some really good growth. And I, th- I like the growth that I saw last year as well. 
Moving on to the final topic here on Trifecta Sports Talk. Going to talk Boston Red Sox baseball. This offensive inconsistency. You're going to be listening to this on a Wednesday, the day after. Top prospect Raphael Devers makes his major league debut at third base. So we'll see what happens with that or, you know, what's going to go happen with it. But lately the pitching has been fantastic for the Boston Red Sox. On Monday night, Doug Fister and Brandon Workman pitched the last couple innings there. I think it was two and two-thirds innings between the two. It was no-hit baseball. You'd be getting really good out of your starting pitching as well as a whole the last couple weeks, month or two actually. Um, your your pitching's been great. Uh, your offense hasn't been great. Guys like Jackie Bradley Jr., Andrew Benatendi, uh, the list goes on and on here. Alexander Bogarts, who dealt with injury, now the flu. Uh, Mitch Moreland hasn't been very effective for you. Your catching position as a whole between Vasquez and Sandy Leon has been ineffective. You go up and down the lineup, it, it's been a lot of not it, – it's tough to say really what's going on with this team. Uh, you know, I talked about this on Monday in terms of the David Price situation and the softness of this team and what happened with Eckersley and all of that. But ultimately, every guy is cold at the same time with this team. And Raphael Devers putting this on him, this is a guy who's batted over 300 for the entire minor league season down there and was batting over 400 for the Pawtucket Red Sox in nine games. So he's a hot hitter. You know, this guy can hit. And I watched him in Pawtucket. I watched Raphael Devers play. And ultimately, with him, I think he's going to be fine at the major league level in terms of hitting. I think his defense can be a liability, and he's 20 years old. You're putting a lot of pressure on a kid like this to all of a sudden produce for you. It's a risky move, but it's a move Dave Dombrowski has to make. Otherwise, he's paying through the nose for a third baseman. What this Boston Red Sox team needs right now, what that lineup needs is Bryce Brents. Bryce Brents plays right field and left field down in Pawtucket. He's been there for years. Um, he hasn't had a really a major league opportunity in about two seasons. Um, he kind of gets forgotten about. He won the home run derby down in AAA this year. Uh, he's a power hitter. You know, this is a slugger. Bryce Brents can hit. He's hitting very effectively for the Pawtucket Red Sox. And this is a guy Boston needs. In my mind, he's the second best pure power hitter in the entire organization. Behind Hanley and Ramirez. Bryce Brents is hot. That's as simple as that. And everyone in the Boston lineup except Dustin Bedroya is relatively cold. You need something. You need some pop. And if you're not willing to make a trade for it, which I don't think they should do, I think the best bet is to look at a guy like Bryce Brents and call him up and say, Hey, buddy, we need you to hit. We need a DH. We need a designated hitter. The issue is you see Hanley Ramirez at first base. I don't know if he wants to be there. I don't think he does. And ultimately, when I see him play, he's a liability. He makes mistakes, a lot of mistakes. But you need his bat in the lineup. And if you want to add some more pop, if that's the way you want to do it, put Hanley at first base and put Bryce Brents over in the DH spot. guy like Blake Swihart is going to make his return in a couple weeks to Pawtucket. He's going to be playing a lot of first and third. See what happens there. If he can get up to speed by September, I want Blake Swihart in Boston. I want power. I want pop. And you got it within your organization. You don't need to trade your prospects for it. You can trade certain prospects out, but I don't think it's worth it for this team. I do not think this Boston Red Sox team is going to win a World Series. I don't think they're mentally tough enough. I don't think they have what it takes for October baseball. I think they're starting a rotation outside of Chris Sale does not have what it takes to win a playoff game. They worry way too much about Twitter, way too much about media, way too much about outside noises, and, and they're just not tough. That's the way this team is. There's no real leadership on it. No, you have guys. You have your starting pitchers getting paid $217 million on an airplane. Trying to puff his chest to your TV guy. A former Hall of, a Hall of Famer. A former MVP. A former Cy Young and Dennis Eckersley. He's trying to puff his chest. Trying to impress his teammates. This guy's making over $200 million. And he cares about what other people think. This is a tough team. It really is. It is a tough team to cover. Um, you know, they don't like the media, apparently. No one really likes the media in Boston, to be honest. Um, I just, they are not tough enough to win anything. They really aren't. How can you handle the pressure of October if you can't handle the pressure of 
the middle of the summer or April or May. It's just insane. You can't handle that. You know, this team's going to have some big questions. And if Raphael Devers can come up and smack the ball out of the ballpark, if the pitching can continue, you know, you'll be in a good position. But come October, it's a different ball game. It really is. And I don't know if they have what it takes. I think they have the talent on the team. I think ultimately it's going to be their mental weakness. Because in October, you need to be tough. And I don't think they're a tough team. And I don't think they can become tough. I think guys like John Farrell... That kind of manager, I think he's the same way. I think it all comes down from him in that aspect. You know, I, I think he's been less bad this year for the most part. I think he's been pretty good, John Farrell, in terms of his in-game management. I think he's gotten a lot better at it, and I've been impressed with him in that aspect. But I think in terms of mental toughness, I think in terms of what is going on in the clubhouse, I think a lot of it stems from him. You know, the fact that there was no apology, really. To, he said he settled it with Dennis Eckersley, but there was no public apology from him. No real public apology from anybody, really. No, kind of the situation that's gone down on this team. It's just odd. It's kind of weird. It's something about, uh, if you really think about it, for a first place team to have so much drama around it, it's kind of weird. You know, um, in 2002, the Boston Red Sox were not a likable ball, ball club. And this is what it kind of reminds me of. And then they shipped those guys out, brought guys in like Johnny Damon. Guys who people could like. You know, I think for the most part, I know Lou Merlone tweeted something out and said, you know, the fans don't like the team or something like that. I don't think that's true. I think Boston Red Sox fans generally like this team. Guys like Chris Sale are very likable. Mookie Betts is very likable. I know this stuff came out about Jackie Bradley Jr., but ultimately that's a very nice guy. And his wife came out and said that he actually apologized to Eck that night. You know, something Shaughnessy didn't actually report, and it wasn't really known. So it's... As a whole, I think they're still a likable bunch. You know, Pedroia has really gotten to me in terms of I, I'm not a big fan of this Pedroia anymore. I cannot stand that situation that happened with Manny Machado, the way he kind of hunkered down and kind of, you know, sat on the floor. It is really weird, uh, that whole situation with Dustin Pedroia. Um, and I think a lot of people could put some unfair pressure on him to be this leader. Uh, but in fact, that's not the way Pedroia operates. He's He's on the field, though. That's the way he guys. He leads by example, where he's not really a clubhouse guy in terms of that. Um, so it's really just, I think they're a likable team as a whole still. I, guys like David Price, you know, the situation of the guys clapping when Price was grandstanding was, you know, I want to know who those guys are because that's kind of disgusting. You know, you can't do that. It, it's despicable. That situation that happened on that plane is, that is not good, you know. Well, simply as simple as that. I, I still think fans like the team, though. They're a first-place team. It's hard not to like that. But ultimately, they're not hurting. They're hurting the brand. They're hurting the way it is. That, in terms of their outlook and the way people look at them, it's a mess. You know, we'll see what happens. That's uh, trifecta sports talk. Thanks for listening. Uh, we'll have another, I think, Facebook Live actually for the next one. Facebook Live will be on Friday and. Potentially be mostly about the Boston Red Sox, but uh, we should hear something about Ryan Spooner. So we'll have an update about Ryan Spooner, some thoughts about that. Uh, Evan Cook will be joining me for that. We'll talk about uh, on Wednesday, Evan's actually going to be at uh, Gillette Stadium talking with Bill Belichick, Devin McCourty, Matthew Slater, Matt, Pat uh, Matt Patricia, Josh McDaniels, everybody. He's going to be talking to there at the media session. So we should have some updates about that. So maybe Friday's show will be Red Sox focused, but... All in all, it'll probably encompass a lot of different things just because there's a lot going on this week and Patriots training camp is starting to pick up a little bit. It's going to start officially on Thursday with uh, the full team reporting. Thanks for listening. Make sure to uh, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and make sure to check out the website, trifectanetwork.com. Thank you for listening to Trifecta Sports Talk. Make sure to tune in every Wednesday from 2 to 3 and Fridays from 2 to 4 on Wire and Facebook Live.